Speak Up's Native Prairie Speaker Series. My name is Caitlin Morose, and I am the Stewardship Coordinator with Saskatchewan Prairie Conservation Action Plan, or PCAP. Today, Dr. Christopher Summers from the University of Regina will be speaking about reptiles on the fringe, movement, habitat, and genetic population structure of northern snakes. Every month, PCAP asks someone to present either in the form of a webinar or an in-person talk in the Saskatchewan community on anything to do with native prairie conservation or species at risk. Don't miss our upcoming Native Prairie Speaker Series webinars. On June 20th, James Page, Species at Risk and Biodiversity Specialist with the Canadian Wildlife Federation, will be presenting a webinar called Help the Bats, Citizen Science and Bat Conservation. That's June 20th at noon. And join us on August 20th for a webinar about the Alberta Biodiversity Monitoring Institute, or ABMI, about their new Wild Tracks program and wildlife monitoring in southern Alberta. And that's August 20th at noon. These webinars are free and you can watch from any location. Just register through our website. I would like to take a moment to note that financial support for today's webinar is provided by our gold sponsors, Crescent Point Energy, Sask Power, Sask Energy, Trans Canada Corporation and Wildlife Habitat Canada, as well as our silver sponsors, Eco-Friendly Sask and Environment and Climate Change Canada. In-kind support for today's webinar has been given by Dr. Chris Summers and the University of Regina. A reminder to all of our listeners out there, if you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to type it into the question section of the webinar dashboard at any time during the presentation. Questions will be answered at the end of the webinar. Now a bit about our presenter. Dr. Chris Summers is a professor of biology at the University of Regina and former Canada Research Chair in Genes and Environment. His research program uses a variety of scientific approaches to better understand interactions between humans and animals and how to mitigate conflict. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Chris Summers. Thank you, Caitlin. Are we seeing the right screen? Yes, perfect. Excellent, okay, well, uh, thank you, Caitlin, for the introduction, and thank you, everybody, for coming online today. Uh, I'm very excited to have a chance to tell you about some of our research on snakes in Saskatchewan. And uh, oh, I guess I'm getting an email message here. Let's get rid of that. Um, and. Uh, really to give you an overview of the program and uh, to give you a feel for some of the things that we've been doing with snakes for uh, over the past uh, more than 10 years now in Saskatchewan. So a little bit about me, as Caitlin said, uh, I'm a biology professor at the U of R. I'm very interested in how humans and animals uh, interact with one another and basically on how to use uh, scientific data to try to understand those interactions and to uh, help out whoever is on the losing end. And uh, sometimes that takes me down the road of wildlife management, and sometimes it takes me down the road of uh, conservation biology, but uh, it's always this theme of, um, of people and animals uh, and how they're getting along. And uh, it takes me down some different roads with different critters, but always that, uh, that same question. And you can see here some of the different animals that uh, my program has been working with over the past few years. And uh, of course, we're featuring snakes today, so it's at the, the top of the image. Uh, I would like to start off with a personal note and uh, say that I come from a family of reptile lovers. And on this slide on the top left, you see my dad uh, holding a, an albino python here. Uh, these two guys at the bottom are my uh, two boys, um, you know, chasing down reptiles on some of our our vacations. And this is just a screenshot of a paper published in Biological Conservation in 2001. And the first author, Victoria Chuse, ended up marrying her. Uh, and she was uh, publishing studies of community structure and conservation in snakes long before I was doing research on them. So uh, a family of, of snake and other reptile lovers and uh, a real strong passion for um, understanding reptiles and having a chance to, uh, to see them in their natural habitats. And this is my younger sister, who's an RCMP officer in Saskatchewan, and she made quite a splash with the RCMP uh, at a boating course on Lake Diefenbaker, where, as you can see in this image, uh, she just leaned over the side of the boat and picked up a big bull snake. And uh, you can't really see it in this photo, but on the other side of the boat, there's a lot of uh, RCMP officers kind of cowering, uh, that were a little bit afraid of the, uh, of the snake. But you can see the big smile on her face, 
And again, the idea is that, uh, you know, reptiles are, are really cool animals and we, we get a lot out of interacting with them. Now, you need more than just the love of reptiles in order to do research on them to understand their ecology and conservation biology. And for that purpose, uh, a collaboration over more than 10 years now between the University of Regina and the Royal Saskatchewan Museum has been a key part of this program. And specifically, uh, myself and Dr. Ray Poulin uh, at the RSM have been working together on, on snake projects uh, since about 2007, 2008. And Ray is, uh, a major spearheader of the snake program and you know we've worked collaboratively uh, extensively on most of the work that I'm going to tell you about and part of that is supervising graduate students and this is just a panel of some of the graduate students that have based their thesis work on snakes or their undergrad thesis work on snakes in Saskatchewan and helped us publish papers uh, to try to get the information out there about what we were finding and uh, as Caitlin and I were discussing just before the broadcast started, uh, grad students are really the ones that do uh, most of the hard work. They spend the hundreds of hours in the field. They walk the thousands of kilometers chasing snakes around and uh, they really gain the insights by being uh, boots on the ground all the time. And so I really wanted to acknowledge uh, these folks and a lot of student uh, field assistants that I couldn't put on the slide that helped them as well. All right, well, let's get into the topic at hand here. Um, as we all know, in this particular group, we are uh, in the Northern Great Plains and the Northern Great Plains have a, uh, are a focal point for conservation issues. And this map uh, on the left of the slide here, I'll try to use the mouse to point it out, shows you in red here, uh, a huge zone of elevated risk to biodiversity for Canada. And this map was put out back in the mid 1990s and it remains true today that uh, where we used to have extensive grassland, we now have lots of conservation challenges. And so Southern Manitoba, Southern Saskatchewan, uh, Southern Alberta, uh, places where we have uh, a higher um, than average uh, risk to biodiversity compared to the rest of the country. And I want to kind of back away from that for a second and think about just the Northern Great Plains itself and what it means to be a reptile uh, in this particular environment. And remember that reptiles are ectotherms, which means they rely on the environment to uh, regulate their body temperature. And if you think about the kinds of conditions that we experience in Saskatchewan, we have a very harsh climate, long, frigid winters, uh, short, hot summers. Uh, for an animal that relies on the environment for regulating body temperature, that's going to be uh, a difficult place to live. And when you superimpose on that harsh climate, um, the fact that we have lost major portions of the native grassland habitat that were here, that, that was here, and that the remnants are essentially fragments, sometimes isolated from one another, uh, which are now facing, facing some pressure from uh, mineral or fossil fuel extractions, uh, you have a place that is very difficult to be a snake for a variety of reasons. So we're starting with climate, it's a difficult place to be a reptile, and then superimposing habitat loss and land use issues on top of that. And a very simple way to visualize just how difficult it is to be a snake in the Northern Great Plains is to just look at patterns in species richness as you move from south to north on the Great Plains. So uh, on this map here, if we're down in, uh, in the southern part of the Great Plains in Texas, you can see they have around 68 species of snakes. And as we move northward, you see this precipitous decline in the numbers of species, uh, 17 in South Dakota, and then down to just nine in Saskatchewan. And really in Saskatchewan, our snakes are concentrated in the south and um, you know, in the, uh, along the United, uh, United States border. And if you move much past uh, about Saskatoon, going further north, uh, you're gonna get down to about one snake species pretty quickly. And this decline in, in diversity is caused simply by climatic conditions. It just gets harder and harder to be a reptile as you move further north in the Great Plains. And so the, the point that I wanna make here is that any kind of challenge associated with loss of habitat is going to be exacerbated by um, this extra difficulty in making a living uh, in the north as a reptile. So the snakes in southwestern Saskatchewan that are of uh, primary conservation uh, interest um, 
are some of the larger bodied species. But what I have here are the six species that make up very interesting and um, unique for Canada assemblage of species in, in southwestern Saskatchewan. So I'll just um, go through this with my mouse pointer here. So on the top left here, I've got the plains garter snake. Very easy to identify by this obvious orange stripe going down its back. Below that is the terrestrial or wandering garter snake. It's a more uh, brown and dun colored uh, sort of checkered garter snake without that orange stripe. Top here is one that probably needs no introduction. This one is the uh, prairie rattlesnake. Just below that here is the bull snake. We've got uh, the western hognose snake on the top right and the eastern yellow-bellied racer on the bottom right. So these are the six species that are found in the southwest of the province. And what's interesting uh, from a kind of community perspective is that three of those uh, six species, so half of them are of conservation concern federally as well as provincially. And so COSEWIC, the Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada, has assessed these species and designated both the prairie rattlesnake and the bull snake as species of special concern. And the Eastern Yellow-Bellied Racer has a federal status of threatened and is on Schedule One of the Species at Risk Act. So half the species in, uh, in this particular community uh, of conservation concern on a national scale, as well as within our province. And it's really these three species that I want to focus on for uh, the remainder of my uh, my presentation today. And it's not that the other ones aren't of interest, it's just that these guys are um, where some of the bigger conservation threats might be. So a little bit about the distribution and natural history of these three snakes. So all three of them share the common feature of being at their northern range limit. And I'm going to start with the rarest uh, of the three species and the one with the most limited distribution in Canada, and that's the Eastern Yellow-Bellied Racer. So what you see on this map here in gray that's shaded, this is the uh, North American range of the Eastern Yellow-Bellied Racer. And you can see that it ranges extensively across uh, the Great Plains. Uh, it's quite widespread and uh, fairly abundant in the United States. But up here at the top of the screen, the red dashed line kind of represents the international border. And you can see that the, the Eastern Yellow-Bellied Racer just pops up into Canada in three places. This part right here is the Big Muddy River Valley. This is the Frenchman River Valley. And then over here, we've got some racers that are associated with uh, one four area of southeastern Alberta. So racers are literally making it to the very, very top extreme portion uh, northern range limit uh, in terms of their distribution um, when they get into Saskatchewan. Now, racers are a uh, fairly uh, large snake. They get up to uh, over a meter in length, and they are an active pursuit hunter, which means they chase things down and catch them and eat them. Uh, they tend to be active during the day, and um, hence their large round eyes. They use uh, sight to help them hunt. They eat uh, a varied diet that can be anything uh, that they can get their, uh, that their mouths around, insects, amphibians, uh, small mammals. They are egg layers that nest, but we basically know nothing about their nest sites uh, or you know, very little about their reproductive cycle. Now, very similar in terms of all those things that I just said is the bull snake. Now, the bull snake is a subspecies of gopher snake, and gopher snakes are found, as you can see on this map here, uh, widely throughout the United States. And again, the red dashed line here is the international border between Canada and the United States. And this black portion of the range here is where uh, bull snakes are uh, thought to be found in Canada. So southwestern Saskatchewan, southeastern Alberta, and uh, bull snakes are the largest um, or among the largest snake in Canada. There's a back and forth all the time about whether it's the largest or not. Uh, let's call it the largest snake in Canada. Uh, it's also an active hunter. Um, it's capable of being active at different times of the day. Uh, when it gets hot out, it tends to hide underground and come out uh, crepuscular periods in the morning or in the evening. Um, it's a bigger snake. Uh, it's gonna be potentially up to a meter and a half, uh, 1.6 or 1.7 meters even. And it will um, most likely specialize on small mammals. It is a very capable constrictor, meaning that it will um, essentially wrap itself around prey and uh, restrict their movement and suffocate them. Like the racer, it is an egg layer. It requires nesting sites to deposit eggs and to incubate them. 
in Saskatchewan, we know very little about where these snakes are uh, depositing those eggs and, and about their uh, nesting habits. And again, want to point out that in Canada, the bull snake is reaching the very northern part of its range. Right? So it's only found in Canada uh, in this uh, area shaded in black in the diagram. Last but not least, uh, again, this is the one that I think everybody will recognize right off the cuff, the prairie rattlesnake. Um, it has a very, very similar features to its range and that, again, the shaded area here shows you that it's widespread and fairly abundant in the United States. Here's the international border as the red dots. And you can see that the range for the prairie rattlesnake is, again, limited to southwestern Saskatchewan, southeastern Alberta. And uh, the snake, in this case, again, reaching its extreme northern range limit in Canada. Now, rattlesnakes have a little bit different uh, biology than the others. They're uh, very much a sit and wait uh, hunter. So sitting still and waiting for prey to come within uh, detection range. They can be active anytime, uh, day, night, or crepuscular periods. They're of course venomous. And uh, I like to make the distinction between venomous and poisonous. So uh, venomous, uh, we refer to animals that act actively use uh, a toxin to immobilize or to attack prey as venomous. Poisonous is if the animal itself is uh, toxic when consumed. Think of like a, uh, you know, a toad or a poison dart frog. Um, so the snake is venomous. It uh, tends to eat a lot of small mammals and it is different from the other two in that it doesn't nest. It's a live bearer and so it has these uh, rookery sites where you'll see large females aggregating and producing live young. Now again, the northern range limit thing, I want to emphasize that uh, we are, you know, up here north of this dashed line. Here's the, the range of basically all three species. And if you picked out a center part of the range, you know, here would be the core of the range, let's say Colorado and Kansas. Um, now one of the major features that I really want you to think about while we're going through this is that how different is life for a snake of any of these three species in Kansas versus Saskatchewan. And just to give you an idea, the average January temperature in Kansas uh, is about minus four degrees Celsius. And if you go up to Valmarie, Saskatchewan, the average January temperature is about minus 19. Okay, so there's a major difference in the thermal energy or lack of thermal energy uh, in the environments that these snakes are living in. And so, I really want to challenge you to think about, you know, does a snake that lives down here in Colorado or Kansas face the same challenges and threats as one that lives up here in Saskatchewan or Alberta? And that's kind of the theme of the, the presentation as we, as we go through. So just to summarize a little bit here, so uh, what I want you to take from that, you know, that natural history intro is that our snakes are at their very northern range limit. Uh, you'll hear about peripheral populations in other places, but really we are at almost at that line in the sand where these animals just can't continue to exist any further north. Um, our snakes use communal hibernacula. I'll talk about that more in a second. Um, they have very limited distribution on a national scale. And so the distribution that we have here is very precious in terms of a conservation context. And of course, I've illustrated that you know, three of the six snake species in this region, the large bodied ones are of conservation concern. Now, going into this research program uh, more than 10 years ago, we, we knew these things and we had a feeling that our snakes faced distinct conservation challenges, but we weren't really certain uh, about how different they were compared to snakes at the range core. And we really wanted to try to understand that to make sure that information gathered in places like Colorado or Kansas was going to be useful for us for understanding our animals here. And ultimately, the bottom line, even after all of our research, is that snakes in our part of the world remain very poorly studied and there's a lot of basic ecological and natural history information that's just plain missing and we have tried to fill in some of those gaps and I'm going to share some of that with you now but there is still a long way to go. So a note about communal hibernacula. So one of the major differences we think is important between the core or the southern part of the range and where we are is that it's so cold here in the winter that our snakes need to get down under the frost line into you know, a hole or a crevice that is going to have the right thermal profile to allow them to avoid freezing and to survive an extended period of deep cold. And these uh, hibernacula with the right thermal properties 
are quite rare in the environment. And as a result of that, you're going to get lots of snakes using them when they're present and multiple species often coming in and out of the same holes in the ground. And you need some kind of geologic feature to facilitate the formation of these uh, hibernacula. And one of the things that's really important are slopes, like the, on the right side of the figure here. And slopes uh, will erode over time and create slumps and overburden. And these often have nice cracks that go down uh, deep into the uh, underlying soil. They're suitable for uh, small mammals like this um, cottontail here to dig extensive burrow networks and to open up the kinds of uh, burrows and burrow networks that species like the prairie rattlesnakes in this picture here need to get down uh, below the frost line. And I find communal hibernacula fascinating for another reason. And you know, I tried to paint a picture for you of how different the snakes are in terms of their life history and their, uh, you know, their hunting and activity uh, patterns. You've got rattlesnakes, bull snakes, and eastern yellow-bellied racers uh, potentially using the same holes in the ground. And to me, this is uh, about equivalent to the idea of raccoons, foxes, and wolves all agreeing to den up together in the same cave for the winter. You know, they're really quite different from one another. And, uh, you know, it's kind of eyebrow raising to see them uh, coming in and out of the same holes. So what I want to do today is tell you about two things, as the title suggested. I want to talk about movement and habitat selection and what our snakes do here. And I'm going to talk a little bit about population structure from a genetics point of view. And I'm going to talk about both of these uh, subjects, hopefully in a way that uh, is not too full of technical jargon and uh, that will make the information um, intuitive to, to follow. And for the movement and habitat selection, I'm going to talk about all three species and our genetics uh, studies to date have been limited to bull snakes and racers. All right, so movements and habitat. Um, so we want to know how snakes make a living. And so we want to know what habitat features are important and how much space they need. And I really love this photograph. This is a picture of a student attempting to radio track a snake. Uh, she's standing on the lip of the French River Valley in the um, Valmarie PFRA pasture. And looking out over the valley, there's a snake somewhere out there with a transmitter in it. Uh, and we're having trouble picking up the signal. And so we're trying to use the elevation to help us find it. And what I love about the picture is imagine a snake that's a meter long and is out there somewhere in that landscape, right? So it's not like birds or mammals where you often might see your study subjects. Snakes are really cryptic. They're really hard to find. And we really have to draw heavily on the technology of radio, uh, uh, radio tracking to, to find them. And even then, we sometimes struggle to do so. But I just really love the, pers the perspective that this photo brings. So for my talk today, I'm going to focus on what's been our, our major study area for the past more than 10 years, which is around Valmarie, Saskatchewan. So we're in the southwest down here in this black rectangle. And if I blow this up, here's the town of Valmarie. And uh, there's a number of places where when we started this work um, that snakes were known to exist. But of interest is that back in 2007, when we started working on them, um, the west block of Grasslands National Park here and a, um, potentially a little bit of the Valmarie community pasture area, these were the only places in Canada with known established eastern yellow-bellied racer populations. Now that has since um, changed. We found uh, and documented populations in other locations, but this was really the hotspot for the eastern yellow-bellied racer at that time. And what we like about it as a study location uh, is that, you know, that that's where racers were, but we also have bull snakes and rattlesnakes there. And we've got some variety in terms of land covered uh, here. So we've got lots of native prairie, but we've also got agriculture. We've got a little bit of um, urban development. We've got roads. So it gives us this ability to try to understand what snakes are doing in a relatively mixed environment. So in order to study snakes, you've got to find them. And this is by far the most difficult part of the research. And we've attempted this in different ways. So on the, on the left side of the screen here, you see Dr. Poulin working really hard to install a drift fence. And the idea is that you uh, set this up sort of like a giant and super painful to install lobster trap. Uh, you can see actually one of the snake funnel traps right here. So you install fences in places where you think snakes are gonna move. 
And at the base of the fence, you install a funnel trap like this one, and you hope that snakes are gonna be crawling across the landscape, hit this fence, travel along the base of it here, and then end up inside of your funnel trap. And you send in your grad students with a bucket and you should, it should just be full of snakes. Well, of course, uh, if you set your equipment up in the wrong place, you'll never see a snake. And so landowner observations about where they see snakes uh, and a little bit of history is extremely helpful in that regard. So in addition to that kind of approach, we also do foot searches. And so you see uh, me here holding uh, an adult Eastern yellow bellied racer that was found on foot. We do road cruises where we look for snakes basking on the road. Uh, and as I said, we talk to landowners and we try to get some observations of where they see snakes. But ultimately, we, we, ha we have to find them and uh, implant them with radio transmitters in order to do any of the, of the work that I'm going to describe. We do work with rattlesnakes and that requires a little bit of specialty training in terms of handling and we've done that in a variety of ways and so on the left of the screen here this is Jessica Martino she was uh, one of our first graduate students to work on this program and she's at a reptile zoo in Toronto here learning how to handle a uh, very large pit viper and you can see by the look on her face and her body language uh, how excited she is about that. Uh, and then you got me on the right here, um, looking at a, a small prairie rattlesnake in Grasslands National Park using a tubing system, which is what we use now. And actually Dr. Poulin at the Royal Saskatchewan Museum is our provincial authority on that. Um, he is now well versed uh, in the tubing method and can provide uh, some insight into that uh, approach and has actually even provided some training for folks who live in rattlesnake country. Anyway, safety always our primary concern when handling uh, a critter like the prairie rattlesnake. All right, so once we have our snakes in hand, we need to affix a radio transmitter to them. And for those of you who are not familiar with radio telemetry, basically what we wanna do is change the snake into a, a radio station. So it's gonna broadcast a unique VHF signal. That's gonna tell us who the snake is and it's gonna allow us to triangulate in on its position using an antenna and walking in the field. Now, snakes presented a, a challenge here, and I never know whether to describe them as being um, either they have no neck or they're all neck, but you can't put a collar on a snake with a radio transmitter. Uh, you can't put a backpack on a snake, and it's because it has no limbs. And so we surgically implant them. And so what you're seeing here is what I call snake graze anatomy, where you have a fairly sophisticated kind of operating room setup here. This is up at the Vet College in Saskatoon. And we put our snakes under and we monitor their heart rates and everything uh, the same as if it was a person undergoing some kind of surgical procedure. And on the right here, you see a radio transmitter. The red object here is the actual broadcast unit. And here's the antenna coming off of it. Um, that gets surgically implanted into the snake's body. And we can then use that as the signal to follow and triangulate positions so we can figure out uh, what the snakes are gonna do. Now, I wish I could say that I was the one who did this, but uh, surgery is not my thing. Uh, we have some partnerships with some very talented uh, veterinarians. So we've worked with Denalyn Parker and Miranda Sadar at the, you know, at the U of S. And we now work with uh, Dr. Tracy Fisher uh, here in Regina. And um, we leave the surgery in the hands of the professionals and uh, they do a, a, just a fantastic job of making sure that our snakes are um, treated with the utmost care uh, because these are animals of conservation concern. We don't want them to be injured or potentially killed by any of the procedures that, we've, that we're uh, working on. All right, so your snake now has a transmitter in it. It's broadcasting, had a chance to heal up. We take it back to the location where we caught it in the fields and we let it go. And now the challenge is, as you see, this is Laura Gardner. So some of you may know her down in the Valmarie area. She works for Parks Canada now. Um, she is out with an antenna here listening for snakes broadcasting their signal. And the idea is that we wanna locate the snake, its precise location every 48 hours. And when we find it, we're going to learn what kind of habitat it's using. We're gonna measure some of those characteristics. We're gonna learn how far it moved. And ultimately what we're gonna do is try to figure out home range size, uh, daily and seasonal movement patterns, important habitat features, and whether the snakes um, are selecting for any major uh, habitat features. And of course, all of that is really critical information for recovery strategies and for conservation planning and uh, just basic ecological data that you need in order to proceed with any kind of um, recovery effort. 
So here's a, a visualization of the kind of data that you get from telemetry. And I'm going to illustrate a lot of the examples with uh, data from one of the more famous uh, snake hibernacula in Saskatchewan called the snake pit. And this is a, a, a well-known uh, overwintering uh, site in Grasslands National Park. So here's a map that shows you the location of the snake pit. It's this red um, hexagon here. This tan uh, cutout here is a large prairie dog colony. Down here is the Frenchman River. And uh, this yellow line here is the Eco Tour Road for those of you who have been down there before. And uh, this spot right here is a popular place to stop and see uh, prairie dogs on both sides of the, of the Eco Tour Road. And then just over here, the snake pit has um, both uh, rattlesnakes and racers, uh, no bull snakes at this location. So, two of the three species of interest. Uh, now, the, I'm going to use this one to provide examples, but importantly, we have studied. Uh, both bull snakes and racers, as well as rattlesnakes at other locations in the French River Valley as well. And so when I show you data, it's going to be aggregate data for all uh, of those different sites, not just this one. Anyway, what are we looking at here? So this is a telemetry trace for a racer. Uh, it comes out of the um, snake pit hibernaculum, hibernaculum site in the spring, and this blue line shows you where it moved to uh, over the course of the summer season, spending a lot of time down here by the Frenchman River, and then traveling back and ending up very close to the snake pit when we stop tracking it in the fall. So this is the movement of one eastern yellow-bellied racer from the snake pit over one uh, seasonal cycle. This is the same kind of information, but in yellow, this is for a prairie rattlesnake. And you can see that the prairie rattlesnake comes out of the uh, hibernoculum spends all of its time out here in the lowland, it doesn't go near the river, it spends a little bit of time in the prairie dog colony and then returns uh, by the same route in the fall uh, before going back down for the winter. And okay, so that's individual snakes and you know it's kind of cool to look at their movement paths but really doesn't tell us a lot. But what you do is you do this to populations of snakes. And so all of these traces that I'm showing you here are all the individual paths for a large number of snakes of both species uh, over a number of annual cycles and you can start to get some patterns and you can start to make some much more reliable metrics about the ecology of these species. And so that's what the type of data are that I'm going to be talking about for movement and habitat selection. All right, so this is my first uh, summary table of data and all it does is basically take some average movement metrics for the three species and put them in a summary form. So let's look at the species one at a time. We've got bull snakes. We've got their daily movement rate. This is the average number of meters they're moving per day. And we've got their maximum distance moved uh, in the next column. And maximum distance is basically if you took a straight line and went from the den site to the furthest point that they traveled away from it during the season, uh, and you measured that straight line, that's what maximum distance represents. So we see bull snakes are moving the least on a daily basis. Racers are intermediate. Rattlesnakes are moving the most, almost double um, the number of meters per day as bull snakes. But look at these distances. These are just wild for an animal that doesn't have legs. You've got bull snakes moving close to four kilometers from the den site, racers moving close to five kilometers from the den site, and rattlesnakes moving over 11 kilometers from their overwintering site during the summer season. Just phenomenal distances. The third column here I'm not going to talk much about, but this fractal D is a metric of what's called movement path tortuosity. I just love that name, tortuosity. Um, basically, it tells us whether the animals move in a straight line or whether they move in a um, kind of a sporadic zigzag pattern. And the answer is they're all zigzaggy, but racers are more um, sporadic and more zigzaggy than the other uh, two snakes. But what I really want to draw your attention to, and what's really important about this basic ecological information, is this maximum distance moved uh, column. And the reason that that's important is that there's one out of three of these species that has a recovery strategy. And the recovery strategy designates the hibernaculum and a 500 meter buffer zone around it as critical habitat. And all I really want to do is point out the fact that racers can move up to five kilometers from the den site. So this 500 meter buffer around the hibernaculum is really uh, an inadequate perspective on critical habitat. And uh, we need to work more towards understanding 
other features that are going to be important for the racer life cycle. And of course, the other animals involved here, 500 meter buffer zones around the den sites are um, not sufficient for them either, uh, particularly for rattlesnakes, which are, uh, as you'll see, moving just these tremendous distances. All right, what about space use? So we know the snakes are moving a lot, but are they using a lot of space? And the answer is um, determined using a technique called uh, minimum convex polygons. And that's just a fancy way of saying that we draw a shape using the outer dots in the relocation data for the um, radio track snakes. And you can see the same data I showed you here, those telemetry traces have now been turned into polygons. And so for example, here's the snake pit and this particular polygon I'm tracing with the mouse. Um, we can draw this set of lines for, whoop, for that snake and uh, you can measure the area inside of that polygon and that tells you what the snake required. And again, we can do this over whole populations of snakes using multiple den sites and come up with uh, aggregate data for the Frenchman River Valley population. So again, a table just showing you the uh, aggregate data for the Frenchman. And you can see that bull snakes um, use the least amount of area, uh, maybe expected based on their daily movement rate being the lowest. But look at the size of this. So this is measured in hectares, right? So bull snakes needing on average 86.8 hectares, right? Rattlesnakes needing over 100 hectares. Racers up to 159, that's 159 hectares on average. Right? So these are huge areas for small, what we thought were relatively non-mobile animals. And what's really interesting is uh, in the next column I have here is the full difference to similar data at the range core. So if I go to Kansas, for example, and I ask how much space does an eastern yellow-bellied racer in Kansas need, we find that our, our uh, racers here need somewhere between six and a hundred times more space than a snake in Kansas. And you see that that's true across the board. It varies a little bit in terms of the magnitude, but all three of our northern snake populations need dramatically more space in the Frenchman River Valley than their counterparts further south. Now, this MCP method, this minimum and convex polygon method, gives us a nice shape, a nice estimate of total space use, but it doesn't really tell us about differences in importance across those different, um, uh, differences in importance of areas within those home ranges. So MCPs are a useful tool, but they're not really a great reflection of important habitat. Right, so we switch to a different method um, called kernel density uh, estimates, and all this really does is produce something like a heat map that tells us something about the relative importance or the relative frequency of use of different locations within home ranges. And what I'm showing you in this particular picture is for the entire eastern yellow-bellied racer group coming out of that snake pit down in Grasslands National Park, and it's presented as a heat map. And the heat map is um, showing you different colors here that represent frequency of use. And what you can see is that there is sort of a dumbbell shape to this. We've got an activity center or an area of concentration around the overwintering site uh, at the den. And we've got an area of concentration here around the summer habitat along the Frenchman River. And so we don't get a nice polygon representing um, the racer home range. What we get instead is um, some activity centers that focus on the area around the overwintering den, the area in the riparian zone next to the Frenchman River, and a corridor that connects the two. So literally a dumbbell shape, uh, like two weights with a bar in between them. Uh, and this is a much different perspective on space use than the simple minimum convex polygon provides. So if we visualize this from the snake's eye view, um, this is a, I'm standing in this photograph at a site where racers are gonna be emerging from an overwintering um, den in the Frenchman River Valley in the Valmarie PFRA. And so the blue arrow here is showing you where the snakes are gonna be emerging from. And they're going to wanna to go to water. That's what we found, right? So they're gonna to wanna to go over here to where the reservoir and the river are. And that is a distance of about three kilometers. Okay, so they're gonna to need to traverse this distance at least twice, once when they come out in the spring and once when they come back in the fall. And I call this the racer gauntlet because they're gonna to have to run a series of challenges to get from the den to the water. They have non-native grass, they've got irrigated hay, 
uh, where the lightning bolts are. They've got two roads they need to cross. And so they potentially face interaction with humans uh, in a couple of uh, profoundly negative ways. And of course, road mortality, big issue for snakes um, sitting out on roads uh, while making the cross here is a, a big risk factor for them. So um, this is basically what they face uh, in terms of space use when you have this dumbbell shaped uh, home range setup. Bull snakes do the same thing. That's not as exaggerated as it is for racers. So here's a den site for bull snakes. Here's their lowland uh, summer habitat. There's their corridor in between. They're not moving as far as racers. And so the dumbbell shape is not quite as pronounced, but still there. Rattlesnakes are wild. <laughs> um, so here's the snake pit den inside of the park. Uh, here's another den over here on a ranch that belongs to the Cornfeld family. And uh, what you can see here is that, you know, the, these blue, sorry, these green dots are all um, rattlesnakes that are emerging in the spring from the snake pit. Uh, they're spending, you know, some of them a lot of time out here, same kind of dumbbell situation as the racers in that area. And, uh, but what I really want to point out is that, you know, the scale here is much different. So snakes that emerge from the snake pit, you know, they might go all the way over here to this um, roadside uh, or over here to this roadside or way up here to the highway. Um, you know, their dumbbell uh, has a much longer bar between the activity centers. They just move much more than the other species. And from a conservation perspective, this black line that you see here that I'm tracing with the mouse, this is the boundary of Grasslands National Park, the West Block. And what you can see is that snakes that are dead center of that protected area in the national park will actually leave the protected space to go out here and sit on the roadside right and the same is true uh, right here with this den these animals are leaving the protected site and going out you know to places where they are not potentially protected um, by the confines of the national park so a couple of important things to say about movements um, snakes move long distances in the frenchman all three species have these dumbbell shaped home ranges with distinct winter and summer activity centers that are linked by corridors. And really ultimately when we go back to the recovery strategy, our impression of the den and that small radius around it being critical habitat uh, isn't inadequate for this particular area. Now the question should come up that, well, this is not the only place where uh, snakes live in Saskatchewan. So what about other locations? And so we have studied bull snakes in the South Saskatchewan River Valley in the Saskatchewan landing area. We find them to be behaving in a similar fashion, large movements, dumbbell shaped home ranges. And we've also studied them in the Big Muddy River Valley in the Ben Goff area. And we find that they don't do the same thing there. And what you're looking at in the picture here is one of the giant fat bull snakes in the Big Muddy eating a ground squirrel. And we found that these snakes don't have to move very far from their overwintering sites to the farmyards and other uh, kinds of places where they are finding um, the food and other resources they need to complete their life cycle. So there's variation in this uh, need for space use, even within the Canadian range of these snakes. To add uh, to that, we are uh, myself and Ray Poulin, we're currently supervising uh, students that are working out of Maple Creek. And you see uh, Jenna and Noah here uh, working away last week on uh, bull snake radio tracking uh, south of the town of Maple Creek. And this is one of their study animals here, a nice uh, big bull snake with um, some beautiful patterns on it. And we are trying to expand our perspective on bull snakes by going to uh, a place that's a little bit different in terms of um, geography and topography. Uh, in the Maple Creek area. And uh, so we'll have to stay tuned and update you on how that's going a little bit later. So we're just gonna skip quickly through uh, habitat selection here and tell you a little bit about what snakes are choosing based on what's available to them in the environment. And this is important to us because we wanna understand, you know, what do snakes actually choose? What do they need when there's a variety of things that they could pick from on the landscape? And prairie environments are pretty diverse, I mean, you know, people have the impression that prairies are boring, that there's not much going on, but they actually do have diversity in terms of habitat types. And uh, these are some of the classifications that we use in terms of understanding what snakes pick. And we wanna know if they're given a choice of these things, which things will they use. 
And I won't spend any time on it, but we were able to classify different types of habitats and look at uh, whether snake use was random. In other words, they use habitat according to its availability or it's non-random where they're choosing uh, or avoiding certain types of, um, of vegetation cover uh, more than you'd expect based on its presence in the landscape. This is a satellite image just showing how that's done with tele uh, telemetry relocations for racers. So long story short, snakes are not using habitat features randomly and that's I think um, pretty much expected. And just a couple of comments about the different types of macro habitats or major features that we studied. Um, we see that racers like riparian zones uh, near rivers. We see that bull snakes like lowlands. Um, they don't really go near water. Often they're in pastures associated with uh, livestock. And rattlesnakes really like prairie dog towns. And I think that's probably due to uh, their interest in young prairie dogs as a food source. So those are the things that the snakes really positively selected for as represented by the symbols here. Crop area on the top here, you see a negative symbol. This means that the, all three species avoided crop. If I skip down to the bottom here, native upland, so moving upslope onto the plateaus around valleys, you see they avoided that. And irrigated hay, they avoided that. Okay, so we know what they a little bit about what they avoid, and we know a little bit about what they like, and we can start to incorporate that into our overall perspective on their um, conservation. So a couple of points to take home about habitat use. Um, snakes are non-random um, habitat users. That means they're selecting. That means they do need particular things to complete their life cycle. Uh, we know that all three species are capable of hibernating communally, that they share the same holes in the ground. But once they come out and start moving around in the landscape, they're actually using different summer habitat features. And as a result, you know, our need to conserve particular habitat features will differ for the three different species. So other than preserving just intact native prairie uh, as a large space, uh, if you want to try to put effort into enhancement or to preserving habitat features specific to these animals, um, it's not going to be a one size fits all for the three species. All right, so I hit you with a pretty big barrage of habitat and movement type stuff. I'm just going to go uh, briefly through some of our genetic work. Um, we know, for example, that racers exist in the Big Muddy River Valley, in the Frenchman River Valley. Um, we know there are bull snakes in both of those locations. And up here north of Swift Current, uh, we know that there are bull snakes in the South Saskatchewan River Valley. And so we really wanna know, uh, are there, um, is there more than one population genetically? Uh, or is there evidence that, that these um, snakes in the different river valleys might be somehow distinct from one another? And to do this, we assess something called population structure using genetic markers. And um, this is just a, a photograph I really like to show of the first live racer uh, captured in the Big Muddy Valley. This is, again, down near Bengoff. Uh, we captured this guy back in 2010, and it was the first one seen alive in the Big Muddy since 1976. And uh, we used a what we call a Judas bull snake to lead us to overwintering sites and we found the first communal dense sites for racers in the Big Muddy and we were able to get um, genetic samples from them and to uh, enable this kind of study to take place. So uh, it was quite a, a fantastic opportunity. And uh, I don't know if any of my colleagues from that uh, expedition are listening online, but uh, I think this is a plug uh, for staying in good physical shape. So this uh, snake was captured down near the bottom of the valley that you see in the background here and you can just see one person kind of uh, peeking out in the background. Um, I, this is my hand and I took the picture and this picture ended up getting published on the back cover of the Blue Jay. Uh, and it's quite a beautiful picture, but I always like to attribute me taking this picture to me being the one who was fastest up the hill with the snake. And the other guys were too slow uh, because they weren't uh, training as hard as me before that, uh, that event. So stay in shape so you can get the famous photographs. Okay, so we collect blood samples from snakes to get DNA. We're collecting racers uh, from the Big Muddy and from the French River Valley. Uh, we're collecting samples from them. It's just a small blood sample like you see here and then the snake is released. Um, so racers were comparing between the Big Muddy and the Frenchman and then bull snakes between all three of the river valleys. And we use a technique called microsatellite genotyping, not really important uh, in terms of detail, but it's just an, uh, a way of comparing populations and asking how similar or different they are from one another. 
So racer analysis, I'm going to focus on uh, part B here, this graph that you see on the bottom. And this is uh, something called discriminant analysis of principal components. All that's really doing is taking snakes and based on allele frequency and identity, it's clustering them. And what you can see here is that the big muddy is in black, the Frenchman is in gray, and they are uh, markedly distinct from one another. And so racers in those two river valleys are genetically distinct, differentiated uh, from one another. And very unlikely that there's a lot of transfer of individuals uh, in recent history uh, between those two populations. Same thing for bull snakes. Again, I'm going to focus on the second panel down here. This is the discriminant analysis of principal components. We're comparing three sites now, Big Muddy River Valley, Frenchman River Valley, South Saskatchewan River Valley. And again, you can see there are three sets of distinct ellipses here representing those three major geographic features. And again, we see a significant differentiation here, particularly the South Saskatchewan, which is right here differentiated um, very well from the other two locations. So again, the river valleys are genetically distinct from one another. It's very unlikely that there are bull snakes immigrating or emigrating between those different locations. So a couple of summary points about genetics. Again, the populations in the major river valleys are genetically differentiated. Uh, dispersal and immigration or emigration is likely uh, not possible between those locations, or at least hasn't been happening for quite a long time scale in, the, in recent history. When we're thinking about conservation needs and conservation planning, we might have to uh, think a little bit about um, the phenomenon of designatable units and whether uh, you know, we need to treat uh, conservation strategies as, as one whole uh, for all these snakes, or if these sites, which are you know, isolated from one another, really, whether they need to be um, potentially planned for and managed as uh, separate groups. So I will wrap up with a couple of final thoughts about conservation where we look at a bull snake in the east block of Grasslands National Park uh, in a place called the Sinking Hills. And really what some of the take home messages are is that the overwintering dens, these hibernacula are critical. They certainly belong as part of the critical habitat definition, um, but they are only really half of the story. The summer habitat and summer habitat features are something that we need to really work into conservation plans. Um, our snakes uh, sometimes need more space than their southern counterparts. So bull snakes, racers, prairie rattlesnakes up here may need more area set aside for them as part of conservation strategies than those in the US. We know from genetic studies now that connectivity is limited. We can't expect something like rescue dispersal, for example. Um, so snakes are not going to move from the Big Muddy Valley to Grasslands National Park if there's an extirpation event, for example. And so that connectivity is important, um, or that lack of connectivity, sorry, is important. And I would say that after you know more than 10 years of studying snakes here, we still know very little. We're still trying to understand uh, their ecology and uh, how they make a living here. And I will stop with just a, a nod to all of the different agencies that have uh, helped us out with uh, funding and support for our snake work over the years. And uh, the image that you're looking at here is a nice heart shape that mating bull snakes make when they, uh, when they get all intertwined here. And uh, hopefully I have left enough time for some questions and uh, I appreciate your attention and uh, listening to the webinar today. Thank you so much. That was an awesome presentation. I really, really enjoyed it. And I learned a lot of new new information. So thank you very much. My pleasure. Um, to all of our listeners out there, if you have any questions, please feel free to type it into the question section of the webinar dashboard. Um, and Dr. Summers, there's a few questions here already. So a listener named uh, Troy would like to know, he says, one of the opening slides indicated that fossil fuel extraction was a land use issue faced by snakes. There was no mention of agricultural activities. However, Dr. Summers indicated how snakes basically avoided farmland, crops, etc. Um, why? Oops, sorry, I lost my spot here. <laughs> One second. Um, uh, why was there an initial statement regarding the negative interactions of fossil fuel extraction and no mention of how? agricultural activities appear to limit snakes and snake movements? Yeah, that's a good question. That 
that's just a, uh, an oversight on my part in terms of making the slides. Um, so the 70 to 80 percent habitat loss that I was referring to in terms of loss of native grassland uh, is attributed uh, by far uh, the majority of that is, is due to agriculture. And so in, in my mind, um, that was the agriculture part. So I didn't mean to single out oil and gas as, a, uh, as something um, sort of separate. It was just uh, the way my brain worked about the subject. So I apologize for that if it seemed like I was uh, singling out oil and gas, but um, you know, the, uh, both of those things are definitely major factors on the, on the landscape right now. Thanks for clarifying that. Uh, one of our listeners named Bianca would like to know about the mortality rate of snakes undergoing the transmitter implant procedure. Yeah, um, that's a great question. We have never lost a snake as part of the implantation procedure. We have never had a mortality event as a result of that. Uh, we have had snakes that have um, been taken by predators in the field when we're tracking them. Um, so there are there's some what I call natural mortality, but uh, we have never had a snake die on the table uh, or in the recovery period after implantation. Wow, that's really awesome. And it sounds like it's a really essential tool to learning more about snake movement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, there's pretty much no other way to do it. Um, it looks like, you know, snakes across Canada are kind of in trouble. Um, and based on your research here and your, your years of experience, what do you think is the best way to, to protect or conserve snakes and help the populations? Yeah, it's a good question, and I wish that I had a specific answer. Uh, most of the answers you get are kind of hand wavy. Uh, we got to conserve habitat, and you know that sort of thing. Um, and I, I would love to give one of those, but I think it, you know, it's it's kind of just paying lip service to the question. If I had to pick one thing that I think we could focus on, uh, it would be road mortality. And snakes are particularly vulnerable to road mortality because they like to come out and bask on roads. Uh, they're pretty slow moving. And I know a lot of them depend on being sort of cryptic. And so when a car comes, rather than trying to get out of the way, they just kind of ball up and try to be um, not visible. And we get we lose a lot of snakes from road mortality. And, you know, it's from standard roads, you know, with people just driving in regular passenger vehicles. It's from farm machinery. It's from industrial machinery. Um, you know, there's a lot of contexts in which snakes are getting killed on roads. And I think uh, if we could do a better job of somehow encouraging people to look for snakes or putting up the proper signage or providing some way for snakes to be safer around roads, that would be the, the route that I would go. Great. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, it doesn't look like we have any more questions, so I guess with that, I just want to say thank you so much, Dr. Summers, for the awesome presentation. Um, it was it was fantastic. I learned so much. <laughs> well, thank you very much for inviting me. And uh, if anybody else has questions that they think of later, they're more than welcome to email me. I'm happy to chat anytime. Excellent. Thank you. And thanks to all of our listeners out there for tuning in today. Uh, when you leave this webinar, you will receive an email um, about a quick one-minute questionnaire. If you don't mind filling it out, that helps us um, keep our Native Prairie Speaker Series webinars going into the future. Um, so with that, thank you very much, everyone, and have a great rest of your day. All right. I guess we're signing off now. Yeah. Bye. Bye-bye.